I'm not going to apologize for reading the Bible because the Bible is necessary for our fundamental growth and development. Amen? Amen? I, I want to talk this morning on the subject matter of why not me? Why not me? Uh, in, 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 my, in my everyday interaction, I talk to a lot of members, I talk to a lot of people, and in my Bible reading this week, I mean last week, I don't know if you remember we read Job 1 and 2, it really stuck out, stuck out to me that a lot of what that, that Job like, Job's life is kind of the antithesis, the antithesis of a lot of people who are either walking with God or who are just living who happen to get hit with trouble and they always ask, the first thing that come out of their mouth is, why me? Hello. So I said, since a lot of what I heard and what I was talking, a lot of people are like, man, Pastor, I'm going through this, I'm going through that. And months previous, I'm going through this, I'm going through that. I, I started reading Job. I said, well, God, this is, this is where a lot of us are in the book of Job. Because hear me when I say this, one of the greatest lies some folk have told in the church is that when you get saved, ain't nothing going to happen to you. Or that because you are saved, it, it insulates you from problems. Now the, now, the book of Job, like all things, deals with a certain level of suffering. And suffering is germane for life, period. So when some people say, well, why is there suffering? Well, there's suffering because of the fall of man found in Genesis chapter 3. There is the fall because of disobedience. I mean, there is suffering because of disobedience. And there is suffering because it is a part of the tension of life because not all suffering is physical. There is suffering that is psychological between choosing what should be right and choosing what is wrong. Okay. In Genesis chapter number 2, God says, he put man in the center of the garden, and he says, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat. There's the tension. Because whether you want to admit it or not, life really boils down to making choices between good and evil. On a daily day basis and really on an hourly basis. And so there is some psychological suffering between choosing what's right. And hear, hear me when I say this. Most of us choose what is the easiest path and what pleases us more than what takes work to deny ourselves. That's why this spiritual breakthrough, this whole thing, we, we spent 15, 20 minutes talking about eggs. Can we eat eggs? Can't we eat eggs? Well, eggs is eggs is, is it is it was the chicken first or the egg first? I mean, what eggs really? I mean, can I have eggs? And before that, it was bacon. Bacon. We got to give up bacon. Bacon. No, I I got to give up bacon. Pass bacon. Yes, bacon. Can't give. I can't have bacon. Really, fifteen minutes on bacon. Fifteen twenty minutes on eggs. Why? Because we're used to. Having what we want when we want it. And that is, part of, that is part of suffering that we don't talk about. The psychological tension between good and bad. Should I cuss them out or shouldn't I cuss them out? And we spend a lot of time trying to get back at people who have made us mad or hurt us. So we spend a lot of psychological time going through suffering trying to determine how am I going to pay this person back? Now, the scripture says if somebody does you wrong, you give them a cup of water. You treat them nice. 
No, 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 no. But society has taught you, no, don't be no sucker. So if I'm not going to be no sucker, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, I'm going to get you back. I'm just going to figure out how I'm going to do it. But somebody told me a long time ago, it takes a lot of energy to be mean and nasty as opposed to being sweet. But in the midst of that, you have to deal with people's perception that you not no sucker. So, so Lord, in the name of Jesus, we come to you today. Help us with this text. Help us with, help us in this time of teaching and ministering, God, for your glory and for your honor, Lord. I decrease that you may increase, that, Lord, it's not me who's seen, but you who are seen. Father, I thank you and I bless you right now that no matter how anointed I am, anoint the hearers that they may receive a word for you that's engrafted into their soul to help them grow. Help me, Lord. I need all the help I can get. Father, in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. So for a text, I want to go to Job chapter 2 just as a text. And we talked about text and context and background and history yesterday in our staff session for all of the great men and women of God that are part of the foundation of this ministry. And again, we're going to be adding to the staff, so I may come talk to you and say, hey, would you like to be part of the core? Don't make you a minister. Don't make you a deacon. It just makes you... Now, I got to put that out there because I, I, I don't want you to get big-headed. It is. more means you mean you have more work than everybody else. Amen. So be careful. Job chapter 2, verse 9 says this. And, I, and, and, and guys, I'm, I'm going to uh, read out of the New Living Translation today because I want I, 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 we, our, our Bible for our church is the New King James but from time to time, that may even change in 2015 to the New Living Translation. But I try to give you a translation that you can understand that speaks to the vernacular of the people so that you can understand without losing the essence of Scripture. There are some Bibles I, I have questions about because you lose a lot of the essence of Scripture. When we, when, when we try to gender neutralize God, you know, instead of calling him father we want to call him him we begin to we begin to we begin to pull down and water down the scriptures it's reasons why god the, the holy spirit used men to shape the bible in the way that it was i know there's a lot of a lot of there's a lot of debate over king james and all that and i don't really want to get into that but i, I worry about some of the newer translations because we want to gender neutralize make everything neutral because as I found out Friday night, we are not male or female. We water. We whatever we need to be. Ain't that right, y'all? Oh, by the way, shout out to the young adults. They had a fantastic Friday night uh, uh, conversation. Yeah, it was, it was very interesting. We, we went from about 11 from the last conversation to about 28, and they deserve the credit for Ray getting the people to come out. So praise God for them. But brought out some very interesting conversation. And again, I would encourage you to come out and be a part if you're a young adult. Even if you just want to come out and listen and be a part, we need some old heads, some gray head folk to come up in there, and, you know, because, you know, when you're in your 20s, you think you know everything. Some person said, you know, I don't, I, my gender is not going to determine my relationship. I said, really? Keep living. Look at Job chapter 2, verse 9. It says this. This is Job's wife talking to Job. He said, his wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. This is Job's wife. Now, you might not understand that because you got to read Job. So I want to go through Job chapter 1, chapter 2. Because to the person that's going through, I want you to look at Job because here is the background to Job. First of all, Job's name means Hated or much persecuted. Job's name means hated or much persecuted. Job was a man who the Bible says, and listen to this. Uh, Job chapter 1, there was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. Watch this. He was blameless. A man of a complete integrity. 
That means he was whole. Now listen to this. He feared God and stayed away from evil. Uh Uh-oh. He had seven sons and three daughters. He had 10 kids. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, and 500 male donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. Point number one, this story begins to tell us about a man, really, who lived an upright life, who had a little bit of money, not just a little bit of money, he was in the Bill Gates arena. He was in the Forbes richest list of people category. And really, he stayed away from evil, had 10 kids. See, watch that. Ain't nothing wrong with having a lot of kids if you can afford them. Floyd Mayweather shows us you can have all the women you want if you can afford them. It ain't right. But the sum total is what the book of Isaiah says, that in that day there will be seven women wanting to be named by one man. That's what the book of Isaiah says. You need to read your Bible. Watch this. Job's sons would take turns, verse number four. Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes, meaning they like to party a lot. And they would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. When these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, that means they partied a long time. Y'all got tired after 20 minutes when the service was over in the New Year. Y'all, y'all went home. These jokers party for seven days. In, the, in Old Testament cultural context, in a marriage feast, a marriage feast, which would, they would party before, have the ceremony, go upstairs and wait for the bride and groom to consummate the marriage, and they would come back and continue to party for up to eight days. They was partying. But listen to what it says. Look how upright Job was. When the celebrations ended, verse 5, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer burnt offerings for each of them. For Job said to himself, said to himself perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their heart. Thus Job was this was Job's regular practice. So Job was, number one, he was rich. He, he had integrity. He was whole. And he prayed and interceded for his kids on a regular basis. He knew they, he, they couldn't listen to Meek Mill. He couldn't listen to Rihanna and, and, and Nicki Minaj on a regular basis and not have something get in their heart. So every morning he would get up and pray for them and intercede for them because he knew in the midst of all that feasting and, 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 and sex and all that kind of, you know, he knew that he had to intercede for his kids until his kids, he could try to pray his kids to a point where they realized they needed God for themselves. Then, watch this, verse number six, one day the members of heaven, the heavenly court, came to present themselves before the Lord, Uh uh-oh, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Now, whenever you go through, understand something, one of the things that happens when you begin to go through is, not only because we are all very aware and very sensitive, whether you saved all the way in or little saved or you out, you start understanding when stuff in the heavens ain't right in your life. Hello. When you say you have an awareness that something is going on because of all of the stuff that's happening around you. But now watch this. Heaven has a meeting. And here's the thing you got to realize and what I always say, and understand this theologically, let's hit it here. There's no dualism in, in heaven. There's no duel between Satan and God. Satan must report to God before he does anything in your life. Really? They came and presented themselves before the Lord, and the accuser Satan came with them. Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. I like this. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Go over to Ephesians chapter 2 for a minute. I just want to show you a New Testament. Uh, keep your hand in, in, in Job. Uh, what I say? Ephesians? Ephesians 2, right? Ephesians chapter number 2. 
just want to read a little few scriptures here. Just stay with me, okay? Uh, verse Ephesians 2, 2. Actually, let's, let's read verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, zombies. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclination of our sinful natures. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Now, the New King James says that he is the prince of the power of the air. And what I like about the New Living Translation, when you go back to it, he says, Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Lucifer sits perched in the spiritual realm, not the highest heaven, but he can get into where heaven is, the high, the three heavens in the Bible. There's the, the, the upper heaven, the sky. There's the second heaven, which is the universe, the stars and the moon. And then there is the highest heaven where God reigns and sits. Mm-hmm. So New Living Translation tells us that he patrols the earth watching everything. How is the devil watching me? Because he's watching you watching TV. The Egyptians had this thing about the third eye, the seeing eye. We, we, you see it mixed in a lot of our culture a lot of times. We, the seeing eye, the third eye, the consciousness is what it means. So he sits patrolling the earth, watching you, watching him. Maybe when you go home, you'll catch it. Then the Lord asked Satan, now watch this. Uh-oh, here, here's where we get problems, verse number 8. The Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? I was going to name this when God brags on you. Satan didn't bring Job to God. God brought Job to Satan. He said, have you considered my servant Job? No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. Watch this. Every voice that rises up in condemnation, watch this, you shall judge, for this is the heritage of the what? Servants of the Lord. Uh-oh. You see, I guess y'all didn't get that one either. So. so God says, hey, we in the, the boardroom. We having a meeting. We sitting back. We talking about the affairs of life, about heaven. And he said, hey, Lucifer, he said, where you been? Oh, I just been patrolling, chilling, watching what's going on. And he says, well, have you considered my servant, Garrett? Huh? No, I haven't, Lord. You need to consider him. Consider him for what? Job didn't do nothing. He wasn't no sinner. He was a man full of integrity, prayed for his kids, took care of his servants, was rich, had money, was paid, black card, chartered plane, got off the jet, had the, the, the pick of whatever camel he wanted, you know, or in our case, whatever car he wanted. Had a range for Wednesday or and a Jag for Monday and, and the Coupe Mercedes. And then he had then he had the Mazda, he had the he had the Lamborghini, and then he had for Saturday just a joyride, he had the Aston Martin. Amen. Had one woman. Paid. Anytime he said, baby, I, I need, she said, don't, don't even worry about it. Go on, go on, take the black car and whatever you need. Took care of his family. Whenever his sons had a party, he foot the bill. What you need? Just on the casual, he, he's, in, he's in South Beach hanging out. Wife said, ooh, I like those red bottoms. He said, go on, get them red bottoms, girl, anything you want. Gave a stack. Here you go, girl, go on, boom, do your thing. 
bam. Servants, richest man in that entire. And then out of all of his integrity, he prayed, he washed out. He was a whole man, meaning he, wholeness is something that, that we strive for. The Bible says he was whole. And in the middle of all this, God said, hey, Satan, have you considered my servant, Garrett, Michelle? They wasn't doing nothing. They go to church every Sunday, pay their tithe, faithful in their ministry because they servants of the Lord. And here go the devil, here go God. Hey, Lucifer, Satan, what have you considered? Why me? Why not you? An attack could mean that God thinks so much of you that he knows no matter what happens, he knows your thoughts are far off and how you're going to respond. Let's, let's read the rest of the story because I like this story. It's kind of cool. Oh, uh, what's up? <coughs> Verse 9, Satan replied to the Lord, yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always, watch this, you have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Uh-oh, point number two. Some of this test that you're going through is the challenge to see how you're going to respond when you go through. Well, why would you say that? Because Lucifer said, hey, you take his stuff away. You take his degree. You, you mess with his home. You mess with the kids. You touch their kids. Touch, touch their marriage. And I guarantee you, they're going to curse you to his face. Job's wife even said, you still holding on to your integrity? Why don't you curse God and just die? Why not just give in to it? Why not just tell God, God, you ain't jack? That's what she's saying. Why don't you go to God, get in his face, and say, God, you ain't jack. You letting me go through this? But the same God that's taking you through was the same God that blessed you. What do you mean he blessed me? You, you don't know how I'm living. You don't know, but stop for a minute. You are living. You still got breath in your body. You still got a little bit of money in your pocket. I don't care if you ain't got nothing in your pocket. You alive to see another day. But there were days that God did bless you. You remember when you was five years old and you went downstairs on Christmas Day and you had all them gifts? That was a blessing from the Lord. You remember them days when you had, you got them jeans, you got, you got them when I was growing up, you got the Calvin Klein and, and you got them nice Nike Jordan. You got your Jordan. God has blessed you. And when he was blessing you, you was good. See, isn't it funny how God is good when everything is going your way? But now all of a sudden, you're going through something because, number one, God has bragged on you. And he's the one that is initiating this conflict. See, th this story deals with the whole concept of, of three things that we need to consider. Uh, I wrote in my notes for a minute. Three things we need to consider in this whole story. And I'm not going to go through the whole story. But we have to consider these things. We have to consider, number one, in the story of Job, God's grace. Then we must consider our ingratitude. Ingratitude, not gratitude, our ingratitude. That we lose a sense of gratefulness and thankfulness in this walk with God. And then third, we must deal with retribution. You may say, well, what is retribution? Retribution is the subline of all the Christian walk. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be a little deep today. I'm going to use some SAT words. We, we must understand the subline of the whole Christian walk in the concept of retribution, that in our minds, God blesses those who do good and curses those that do bad. It is that works mentality that we have that we feel like if I do all these good things, then God should always bless me. 
If I walk a straight line, if I, if I don't cuss, if I don't sex out of wedlock, if I, if, if I don't drink, if I don't do this and I don't do that, we, we line our Christian walk up with the don'ts and the do's. And if I do more, more do's than don'ts, then I should be able to be blessed in what I do. It's the sense of if I dress the part, look the part, go to work at the right part, then I'm what a Christian is. Remember I told you we have the good Christian versus the bad Christian. That if I'm not wearing a suit, I'm not a good pastor. If I'm not wearing a suit and tie, wearing a Rolex, I'm not a good pastor. If I'm not, if I don't have big eyes. So, so what do you do in the case of Job when he's rich beyond compare? He got 10 kids and everything is, is looking great in his life. He got a pocket full of money. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, boom, he gets hit. How? No, 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 no. How do you judge your life when you do everything right, but yet you still short? What do you do? What do you do when you live right and you're still fighting diabetes? What do you do when you're paying your tithes and then you still got a lien on your house? What do you do when the IRS is messing with you and you're doing everything that you're supposed to do? What do you do when you do everything right, ladies, and your husband still walk out on you? What, 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 what do you do if you pray all the time and you interceding for other people and your kid still gets caught up and goes to prison or your kid gets caught up and goes to jail or you see your daughter one day spinning on a pole being a stripper? You remember the story in the Bible? There was a son who went blind and, and, and all of a sudden they, they asked him, well, who sinned? Who sinned? What you do when you come home and, and check your, your son's drawer and, and see five pounds of marijuana in his drawer? Who sinned? Ask Michael Brown's parents. Who sinned that got him shot? See, this is the retribution that in the body of Christ we don't talk about, but this is the theological underlining of our walk. The retribution, uh, you reap what you sow, Galatians 6, 7. If you sow sparingly, you don't, you don't get, you reap sparingly. But, but we don't consider God's grace. Grace, grace, unmerited favor, grace. Grace that God will bless you because he want to bless you. Ain't got nothing to do with your lifestyle. Ain't got nothing to do. See, watch this. He, it rains on the just and the unjust. Now, watch this. On the earth, and I walk earthly, you're you going to see God bless the good and the bad. Because I've seen a lot of drug dealers being blessed. I've seen a lot of no good people being blessed. I, 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 I was in a conversation about four or five years ago. I said, I was talking to a friend of mine. I said, why is it that the dudes that act like buttholes get the furthest in the in, in church world? Mm -hmm. You've asked that question too. How, 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 can, how come some men can walk in and be arrogant, nasty, treat their staff mean, but got thousands of followers? You may not like them, but because they mean, arrogant, nasty, rude, you'll give them whatever they want. Somebody nice come up to you, treat you right, you turn your back, won't even listen to them. You, you, everybody got to always be prophet this, prophet that. Somebody, that. somebody give you a word real simple. They on point. This person missed it. This person told you the truth and will get you where you're supposed to do it. But this person, no, because it, it ain't this person with all the glam, with all the shine, with all the swag. You, this, this person, oh, no, 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 you can't be, you can't be sin of God. This person have you stand up in line, give him a thousand dollars for an offering, telling you stuff that's in the Bible ain't even accurate. This person will name your address, telephone number, told you who's sleeping with everything, then got you on where you're supposed to go. But this person ain't no God. No, this person is. You gave him a thousand dollars. Why? Because that's how we've been set up. But Job contradicts our whole theology in the aspect of what do you do when you live in right? And you still going through because in the it's four tests that Job dealt with. Watch this. Let me watch this. You go go in this thing, okay? So he said, well, uh, 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 he said, um, all right. Now watch this, verse twelve. All right, you may test him. The Lord said to Satan, do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the presence of the Lord. 13, one day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house 
a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys and feeding beside them. Then the Sabaeans raided us. They stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I am the only one to escape to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all your shepherds. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. I wish he just would have killed all of them. Uh, while he was still speaking, a third messenger came. This is the third one. Arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one. Uh, who escaped to tell you. Now, verse 18, while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and your daughters were feasting in the oldest brother's home. Suddenly, powerful winds swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. You ever had one of them days when it just won't stop? You, you like me, some days you don't even want to go to the mailbox because you don't even know. You be like, oh, Lord, please, not today. <coughs> I guess I'm the only one. You ever been on your way to work and just in your stomach, you say, you know what, something, I don't know what's going to happen, but something. Four times right in a row, boom, 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 boom. Your kid's dead. Your, all your animals gone, this gone, this gone. Your Boom, gone. But the crazy thing about this was this was God allowed this. Satan couldn't, can't do nothing without first saying, hey, God. And, and here's the crazy thing. It wasn't Lucifer's idea. Lucifer just, when God, now he knew a Job. Because when Job, when God said, hey, have you considered my servant Job? He said, well, he got a reason to bless you. He got a reason why he praising you. Look at all he got. Eat good, live good, dress good, wife fine, kids nice, everything going good. He got, you got a page around him. Here's the point. What you have today, you might not have tomorrow because it can be gone just like that. That's why you can't put all your trust in your things. Because your things can be gone. Just like that. See, see, watch this. Now watch this. Let me, let me help some folk now. Let me, watch, let me help some people. Let me help some people. Don't ever think that everything that happens in your family is as a result of the devil. It could be that the Lord allowing is allowing Satan to test you. Your husband, your spouse, just for no reason, just start going, like, what happened? What happened? Somebody just walk out on you for no reason. You're like, what happened? What did I do? See, you see what I'm saying? That's the first thing that that's the first thing we ask ourselves. What did I do? Why do you have to have done anything? Women fall in this more, I think, more than men do. Because if dude walk out on you, first thing you're gonna do is start questioning yourself. Well, I wasn't pretty enough, I wasn't light enough, I wasn't dark enough, I ain't had this, I ain't had that, I didn't do this, I didn't do this enough, I didn't do that. Well, why do you have to have done anything? Could it be a challenge to the integrity of your walk with God? Whenever you decide you're going to get, you're going to start going, go hard for God. That commitment is going to be tested over and over again. It ain't nothing you did as a person except say, I'm going to be and live for God. Then God says to Satan when he comes in his presence, have you considered my servant? What? You mean I didn't do nothing? Well, what's this? 
Go, go to Psalm 103 for a minute. I told you I, I'm, I'm going to read from Bible today. We need to read the Bible. Psalm 103. Now watch this. Psalm 103. This is one of them psalms you got to, you should always keep in your back pocket. Verse 1. Let all that I am, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from the death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and is merciful, slow to anger, and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. Verse 10, he does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. It's 10. Mercy, grace. He does not punish us for all of our sins. That's mercy. Told you this is not about what you do or don't do per se as much as it is God bragging on you. And aligning, watch this, and aligning your response to a good God, despite of what he allows to hit our lives. Just because your husband act, don't, act, don't act right, your spouse, let me say your spouse don't act right, don't mean you got to stop fussing and cussing. When, watch this. When you respond in the way of the accuser, you just nullify God's mercy and grace for your life. What do you mean? He's called the accuser of the brother. So you sitting up there and you fussing and you calling that your spouse this, that, and another. You ain't say nothing that God says he said because this is what confession is. It's speaking what God says, not what your flesh or your emotions say. I hate you. I don't like you. You start cussing them out. You just, you just blah, 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 you just have fallen in line with the accuser of the brethren. Oh, we ain't going to never make it. Oh, it's going to fail. I, I remember there used to be this uh, 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 I, I, there used to be this cartoon, and there was this little guy. He was the most pessimistic person you'd ever Oh, my goodness. I, we ain't going to never make it. Every time trouble hit, we ain't going to never make it. We ain't going to get out of here. We ain't going to do it. And that's how, and that's, well, that's the spirit of the accuser. I ain't going to never get out of this. I ain't going to never be nothing. I ain't going to never have nothing. I ain't going to never. I, you know what you're going to have, what you say. Well, that's easy for you, Pastor. No, 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 no. Watch, watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Okay. A true confession. So, like, the other night, my, my son, I, I, my, my, my son, we go through this all the time, you know, and I had an epiphany. Boop. And so my son, is, he's playing varsity, and he's, he's growing and developing. And me, I'm a perfectionist when it comes to basketball, forgetting that I had to grow and develop as an athlete too. So she always tell you, you're just so hard, you're just so critical. Because I see the end, and I, I want him to be at the end now. You ever see the end? But then for us who see things, we forget the process of growing through and growing up that you have to grow up into that. So you know me, you listen to me, you be like, man, you sure are, you, what's, you're just, ugh, what's wrong with you? Because I forget and I get caught up in my flesh. So my response isn't what it should be. So the other night, I'm, I'm, so when I went, I left the game, I was just mad. They won by 30 points, but I was just mad. It was an ugly win. No, see, 
athletes and bas- you know athletes understand what I'm talking about. You can win a, like there are there are great losses and there are ugly wins. Like you can you can lose right, but you just lost. And you can win by a big margin, but it be ugly. Because when you when you know something, you know the fundamentals. Like there is there is a great word, but technically it's it was terrible. Preachers understand what I'm talking about. Homiletically, hermeneutically, you didn't follow the rules. You was all over the place, but somehow you pulled it back in, and the Holy Ghost got you where everybody was standing up. See, you can have a great message, but technically be wrong. A cook could tell you, you you can have a great dish, but there's something that you didn't do right in the preparation that would have made it better. So it was a great meal, but it was still, you still was bad. Bad ain't got nothing to do with you as a person. Just means technically there's some things. So they won big, but they won ugly. Because technically I'm looking at all this stuff, and when you know and you play, you're like, oh, man, that you, did, you didn't set the pick right. You didn't the cut. Oh, man, you was just, it was just, oh, it was just ugly. And I was mad until I went to Friday night conversation. And I'm sitting there in Friday night conversation, and I'm listening, and the Holy Spirit said, isn't it funny how every generation has got to grow up into its potential. And the light went off in my head. And I said, God, dog, maybe I should apply that to my son. That it's hard to sit through the growing pains, but it's still growing pains. Because after all, God says, Peyton, how do you think I feel when I watch you sometimes. No, it, it was the truth. See, you understand something. The older you get in God, the more you realize, even though the truth may hurt, it's the truth. And, and see, watch this. Now, watch this, lady. Sometimes you marry somebody that's not. You, ha- you see a vision for them, but they haven't grown up into what you expect them to be. But they still have to go through the growing. And when everybody was telling you not to, you, you hung on to the potential and the vision that you saw. But it's the process that's killing you. Say that again, first lady. Yes, Lord. Amen. No, I'm just saying, you're right. Yes, Lord, it's the truth. (laughs) But listen to Job's response. Watch this, watch this. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell on the ground. Context, remember, anytime sorrow or mourning came, they would always rend their clothes and put ashes on their head. It was a way of showing mourning. No, look at what he said. Man, he lost all his stuff. This is how we have to learn to grow into I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all this, watch this, in all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Well, I don't blame God. No, you don't, you don't open your mouth and blame God. But your actions in your body language and the things you do to yourself Say, screw you, God. Mm-hmm. Your overeating ain't because you're hungry. Your overeating is because psychologically, somewhere deep down inside, you're mad at God. Emotional eater. Mm-hmm. You're drinking, cussing, and fussing while consciously you just saying, well, I'm social and, and I'm just doing No, somewhere... You're responding to what you're going through, and you're using that because you know drinking is bad for you. You know smoking is bad for you. It's on the package. There's commercials everywhere. You see it. <coughs> you know you're playing Russian roulette sex with folk you out there sleeping with because you ain't using no protection. It's because something has hit your life that 
You can't explain because you done did everything you felt you did right. I went to church. I paid my tithes. I'm involved in church. But now something done hit. Your car ain't working. Your relationship ain't working. Your mom and daddy done tripped on you. Something has happened. So in your, in your conduct and your lifestyle, you say, screw you, God. You stop talking, you stop raising your hand, because it's all signs that what you're going through has pissed you off. You ain't got to say it. 1 Samuel 15, God looks at the heart. He don't look at what you do externally because we know how to play game. We know how to do everything right. But when it comes to opening up your mouth and praising and thanking God, I told you, you know when you begin to mature, when you can praise God through the bad time. Well, how do I know? How can I get through? Read the book of Job. Now watch this, I'm not going to read all of chapter 2, I'm going to finish, watch this. One day the members of the heavenly court came again to present themselves before the Lord. And the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from, the Lord said, asked Satan. Satan answered, the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. The Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant, Job? There twice. This time he touches his body. So in the first two chapters, Job gets tested on his possession and then his health. When, 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 when I went to the hospital, my sugar, my sugar was like 800. And I remember, I remember laying on the table. I felt fine. I ate some pork and beans. And I didn't start feeling well. I said, man, let me go to the doctor. I went to the doctor. He said, man, I went in the emergency room. They said, Mr. Gray, your sugar is like almost 800. I said, really? I don't feel it. He said, what you eat? I ate some pork and beans. Oh, Mr. Gray, we got to keep you in the hospital. I said, what? He said, you, you, you. <laughs> They're like, you should have passed out. So I'm in the hospital. I'm, just, I'm laying in the hospital. And every time the nurse came in, they said, well, what you in here for? I mean, I'm in the hospital chilling. I mean, ain't nothing really wrong with me. I don't feel, I'm just chilling. Well, what's wrong with you? I got sugar. Really? I'm like, what's wrong with you? So every day they kept coming in, because I stayed there for the whole weekend. They was like, well, what? well, what's wrong with you? Because I did not look like a person and God said, Peyton, um, I hate to tell you this, but you ain't going nowhere. I said, I know that. He said, well, why? Why do you know that? Because I said, God, what's in me ain't out of me yet. You can't go nowhere until you fulfill your purpose in life. But they were surprised at my response. Because even though something had touched my body, it couldn't stop me from praising my God. Now it's a drag. But God said, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna have you considered my servant, Peyton. Two years before that, I was in a car accident. Almost killed. They, oh, that man said, the fire, my, he said hey, if you didn't have your seatbelt on, you'd have been in bad shape. I said, well, I had my seatbelt on. The only thing that made me mad was I was in the ambulance. I was on the ambulance, you know. And I said, where are you taking me? They said, well, we're taking you to PG. I said, stop. <laughs> I said, stop this thing right now. Where my wife at? Well, your wife, get my wife. Well, I don't want to go to PG. Well, Mr. Gray, that's the only, I said, well, you know what? I'm thinking. I'm like, where can I go? I was like, I'm just thinking. I do not want to go to PG. That's, that's like, you know, you just might as well say I'm dead. <laughs> PG is the pits. Yeah, I said it on the thing. On the CD, I was like, it's PG. I was like, stop this thing, stop. They said, well, we can stop, but, but, but I was like, so I went, and I'm laying in there. I'm, they, they put me in a thing. On, I'm on the gurney laying on the side of the wall for 20 minutes, and they left me there. That's why I said, get me out. 
I'm laying in the hallway. Help! And this is crazy. I'm saying help, and people are passing by me. Leave me there. Help! So finally, the other Kevin came in there. He said, he said, what's wrong? I said, Kevin, get me out of here. <laughs> my neck is back. I think my neck is being I'm going to die because my neck is going to break. Kevin, get, get my wife. Get me out of here. Well, Mr. Gray, we got to get, get me out of here. Y'all Negroes is going to kill me in here. And ain't nothing wrong with me. Now, I'm going to show you how bad it was. I had a broken spleen. I had a broken uh, sternum. They took an x-ray and didn't see my sternum was broke. They did not see it. And they took an x-ray. They took a body x-ray and didn't see I had a broke. I went and took a, I went and took a virtual physical. They said, Mr. Gray, have you been in an accident? I said, yes. They said, because your sternum, I said, really, it was broken? I said, I went to the hospital. And so the dude said, well, what hospital did you go to? I said, PG. He looked at me and said, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> He said, Mr. Gray, he said, you. So I made a vow. I said, Martha, if I ever get in another accident, Lord willing, if you get in an accident, I'm going to put you in the car, and we're going to GW. I'm going where the white people go. I'm not going, I'm not going to PD doctors. I ain't going nowhere. No, listen, if, if y'all ever with me, don't take me to PD. I'm telling you, I will cuss you out. You better stop this guy and take me to the GW. Take me to Georgetown. Well, what if they won't admit you? I'd rather die in the waiting room at Georgetown than GW. Never mind. Let me stop all right, let me, let me help me hurry up, hurry up. <coughs> Verse number three, the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth. There you go. He's blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil, and he has maintained his integrity even though you urged me, watch this, you urged me to harm him without cause. Satan replied to the Lord, skin for skin, a man will give up everything he has to save his life, but reach out and take away his health, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, do with him as you please, the Lord said to Satan, but spare his life. Now, this is God initiating this. This ain't the devil going to God, picking on him. This is the Lord. Have you considered? Now he done took all this stuff away. Now he's going to do a deal himself. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. Okay. Uh, now let, let me show you. Let me show you. Verse, verse no. Satan left the Lord's presence and struck Job with terrible boils from head to foot. Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery as he sat among the ashes. His, now this is, this is our text. So his wife said, are you still trying to maintain your integrity, curse God and die. Now I know, no, no offense to nobody. Now I know God. No, 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 watch, let me show you how. Most of us would say, God, why don't you take my spouse? I mean, you took my kids, you took my everything, but you left her here. For real. Come on, God, if you're going to do it, you might as well take this, take everything. You really had to, I mean, you had to leave her with me? I'm not trying, I'm not talking about anybody. But isn't it funny how, well, now watch this, because this is a story, the rest of the story is about how his friends come, and, they, and they're going back and forth and bantering about what's going on and God. And there's always the people that's closest to you that sometimes you wish they would just, please be quiet while I'm going through this. Because I'm struggling with trying to understand why I'm going through this? No, no, watch this. So she said that. But Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all, so in all this, Job said nothing wrong. 
Now watch this. I'm almost finished, y'all. Verse 11 through verse 13 talked about how his friends come to comfort and console him. But look at the B part of verse, the C part of verse 13. For they saw that his suffering was too great for words. Sometimes as a friend, someone who's watching somebody go through the process, sometimes the best thing for you to do is to say nothing. Okay, watch this. Go to, go to, Job, go to Job 42 for a minute. Go, go, go to Job 42. And even as a parent, sometimes I'm learning. I got to be quiet. Now watch this. Watch this. Verse 38 for a minute. Verses 1 through 4. I don't want to, you, when you get through Job, you'll read this. But if you want to go back and read this in your own personal time as well. Then the Lord answered Job, because now it's been a series of questions and conversations. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom? Remember I said that the title of this message is Why Me? And in the process of this, we always begin to ask God a serious question. Now watch this. He says out the whirlwind, who is this that questions my wisdom? <laughs> With such ignorant words. Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you. <laughs> and you must, well, watch this, and you must answer them. Then he says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Now you read the rest of 38, he has a whole bunch of questions about the animals, the sea, and all that. But well, watch this, go to verse 40, go to chapter 42 now. Chapter 42. Chapter 42, verse 1. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything, and no one can stop you. You ask, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. Now, this is, now this is where self, this is where self-examination comes in, and this is how you come to the conclusion of how you answer God. Yeah, I'm stupid. You're right. I am ignorant. I really don't know as much as I think I know. Uh oh. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about. I remember a long time ago, Elder Merrily told said this in class. The more I study, the more I realize what I don't know. The more I live, the more I realize how much I don't know. The more I interact with people, the more I know I really don't know people like I think I know people. Mm -hmm. That's why I say keep living. The one of the foolish things, most foolish things I heard the other night was people in marriage don't transition. The question was that in marriage, do you transition from once you get from going from singleness to marriage? But even in marriage, there's always transitioning because as a human being, you're constantly growing. That, 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 that's why I watch this. Uh, an, uh, uh, an amendment to our conversation is just when you think you know somebody, they change because they grow. So you can't, you can't, you have to, you have to get to know, you have to know that person every day differently because that person can be different on the day. That's, that's why one of the great reasons I, I'm glad I left Evangelist because people always thought I was this young dude that they saw growing up. They never let me, sometimes, never let me be elder. They always saw, I knew you when you was, they swore I was 18 when I came. I was, I'm not 18, I was 23. No, you wasn't no 18. I knew you when you was just little. You was little. I'll say, you know what, get away from me because I cannot talk to you. you I'm always going to be, you know what I'm saying? You can't always see me as Pastor Payton because sometimes profit kick in. I can't always just know you by who you are because sometimes your gift kicks in. And sometimes when you deal with people, you got to understand you're not dealing with flesh. You're dealing with a gift that may be on. That's why sometimes you have to, that's why you got to be careful putting your mouth on people because you don't know who you're dealing with. See, watch this. When I'm weak, 
I'm going to come to you and say, listen, I'm struggling. Now you know you're dealing with flesh. But if but sometimes you be talking to me and I start looking at you funny, it's like, uh-oh. The Holy Ghost just, boop, kicked in. Man, watch this. Where was I at? Okay. Things I knew nothing about. Things far too, t- far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have questions for you, and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before. But now, watch this, in all of that we go through, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said and sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. See, if you and I would stop hating on going through what we go through, we're going to see God. You're going to see God move when you shut up and stop acting like you know everything. And stop getting mad. Now watch this. Even when you get mad. First, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, 13 says, even when we're faithless, he's faithful because he cannot deny himself. Sometimes you got to be quiet, shut it down, and understand, I don't know nothing. I don't know how to deal with this situation. I don't know how to change this person. I don't know how to get to this person. I was in the car. I said, you know what? I just need to be quiet, shut up, sit down, and just be dead, and just let whatever going to happen, happen. I say, God, now it's going to be hard, but you know what? I really don't know as much as I think I know because I'm stupid. Oh, gee, that, that's kind of hard. No, 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 no. It's the truth. How do you change a person? Tell me what to do to get a person to change. You can pray. You can intercede. You can give. You, you can do all of that stuff. And then the person still don't change. Then one day out the blue, boom, the person changed. What did you do? I don't know. What do you do to cause the church to grow? You know what? I don't know. You can put advertising, you can be on TV, you do all that, spend thousands of dollars in marketing and do all that. And guess what? Nobody show up. One day you walk in, boop, the people are full. What did you do? I don't know. Ask yourself this question. Sometimes you get all, you get, you get all dressed up, you get all sharp, looking all good, boo-boo, to try to attract somebody, don't nobody come. Put on obsessions, sex on the beats, all this other kind of perfume, sweet sex, all this kind of stuff. Put on shirt, be buttoned all the way down here, collar on. Boom, you walk out there, you got the nice car, people just walk past you. One day you coming from the gym and you riding on the metro and you got 50 people looking at you coming up. You, oh, you sure look good. <laughs> Hair all out of you. <laughs> What did you do? Don't know. Because when God wants to add to or bless you, he does it in his own time, in his own way. Why? So that we can take no credit for the change or what's going to happen. Okay, now watch this. This I want to leave you on this blessing. So Job Job tells his friends, Job got to pray for you. Verse number 10. Then Job prayed for his friends. Now, I'm not going to read it from this version. I like this. I like the King James version of it. I'm, I'm just about I'm finishing. I'm ending on this one. I'm getting right in. I hear y'all clean. Y'all throw. Y'all ready to go. And the Lord, watch this, verse number 10, reading the New King James now. Then the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. And do, indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. He gave him, I like Noel Jones said this, I heard him preach this, he gave him double for his trouble. Mm-hmm, yeah. He gave him double for his trouble. See, that's why, watch this, I told you last year, 14 was deliverance. He took us through a lot of hell and high water, and we lost a lot of stuff. But in the year 15, rest, he going to give you double 
for your trouble. Because you got to understand, it ain't nothing you can do. There ain't nothing you can say. There ain't no place you can go except be in the place that God has for you. That God will bless you and restore everything that he took from you. But you in this season, stop opening your mouth. Stop acting like a know-it-all. Stop acting like you all that in a bag of chips. Stop acting like you got your relationship with God together. And be honest and say, I don't know nothing. I'm not where I should be. Lord, help me. See, watch this. Job's praying for his friends because they gave him such a hard time. And let me speak to somebody today. Somebody's giving you such a hard time. Coming against you, fighting you, accusing you, talking to you, not cooperating. And instead of getting them back, Job prayed for them. The Bible says, vengeance is mine. So how are he going to get them back? Through you praying that God would bless them. Because that's the highest sign when you ask God to bless those that have despitefully used you. You don't know what they did to me. I'm sure it was terrible. But if you pray for them, you're going to release some of your unforgiveness. You're going to release some of your anger. And you're going to release God's hand to move because it says, after Job prayed for them, he gave them twice as much as he had before. That's why I say, if God takes something away, be prepared to go through. But after you go through, be prepared for God to restore to you what was taken from you twice as much. But it's contingent on your praying and blessing your enemies. That you pray and bless your enemies. See, that's why it's not as hard because now you deal, now you're dealing with the tension and the suffering of what you know you should do and what you want to do. Why should I pray for them? Why? Why? They walked out on me. They dropped me. They stole from me. They did this to me. They did that to me. But God wants to bless you double for your trouble. He wants to bless you double for your trouble. If you were to tell me all I had to do was give my enemy a drink of water and I get the Powerball prize of $125 million, you telling me that the dollar amount would not make you and convince you to bless? I'd go buy them a 50-pack a deer park, parking on their thing and me smiling. Hey, man, God bless you. Thank you for what you did. And walk away and get my lotto ticket for 125 million. I say it was worse every bit of it. It was worth every bit of it. Because when I'm on the beach in St. Thomas laying back on a speedboat, I say, thank God for my enemies. Thank God for every arrow they shot. Thank God for every word they told me I wasn't going to make it. Thank God. (laughs) 
We don't value the blessing more than we value our own personal vindictiveness to pay people back. <coughs> God want to bless you, but you want to hold on to that anger so much, that unforgiveness so much that you robbing of what God wants to do for you. And people ask, this thing don't work. It don't work if you don't do what God asks you to do. Some of you are single because you holding on to something in your past when God want to bless you with a great person, man, a woman of God. Some of you are in, in ruts because you don't want to let go of something. You can't get what you want because you won't let go. You're struggling with your kids because you won't let go of something. Won't let go. So you sit there with your boils and sores. In your ashes. You sit there. No, 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 no. You sit there. Stay there. And when people keep going past you, blessed, you riding in the hoop, and God's like, I got a Suburban for you. I got a Q60 for you. But because you won't let go, I can't bless you the way I want to bless you because you won't let go. You got poor self-esteem because what's blocking you is you won't let go. And what you see, the ugliness you say that it is, is really the unforgiveness that you won't let go. So watch this. I'm over. I'm finished. Watch this. Now watch this. Who got to let go today? Who got to let go today? Who got to let go today? Then come up to the altar and let go.